of Wisconsin. We're both natives of, of Wisconsin. My wife grew up uh, just east, just west of Appleton in a community called Hortonville. And I grew up on a dairy farm five miles east of Abbotsford, Wisconsin. My dad was not only a small dairy farmer, but also an electrician. And he brought electricity into the many farms in the area. In fact, uh, just this morning I was talking about Camp Four Springs. My dad was one that wired the original Neal Lodge in the 60s in, uh, at Camp Four Springs. Uh, I encourage you to uh, use the sermon notes that you find in your bulletin this morning. Growing up on uh, a dairy farm in our farmhouse kitchen, we had a, a bird cage. And the uh, opening illustration has particular meaning for me because as a teen teenager, I had a pet parakeet called Pretty Bird. <laughs> it could actually say Pretty Bird and ask the question, what are you doing? <laughs> I want to talk to you about Chippy the Parakeet. In his book, The Eye of the Storm, Max Lucado describes the exceptional difficulties in the life of a small pet bird called Chippy. Chippy the Parakeet never saw it coming. One second he was peacefully perched in his cage. The next he was sucked up washed up and blown over. The problem began when Chippy's owner decided to clean Chippy's cage with a vacuum cleaner. She removed the attachment from the end of the hose and stuck it in the cage. The phone rang and she turned to pick it up. She would barely said hello when Chippy got sucked in. <laughs> The bird owner gasped and put down the phone, turned off the vacuum, and opened the bag. There was Chippy, still alive, but stunned. Since the bird was covered with dust and soot, she grabbed him and raced to the bathroom, turned on the faucet, and held Chippy under the running water. <laughs> then realizing that Chippy was soaked and shivering, she did what any compassionate bird owner would do. She reached for the hairdryer <laughs> and blasted the pet with hot air. Poor Chippy. He never knew it hit him. A few days after the trauma, the reporter who had initially written about the event contacted Chippy's owner to see how the bird was recovering. Well, she said, <laughs> Chippy doesn't sing much anymore. <laughs> he just sort of sits and stares. <laughs> Can you identify? <laughs> Many of us feel like little Chippy, at times overwhelmed, stressed out, or even stunned. This morning, I'd like to share with you that God can handle anything that we're facing. Let's pray. God, you know about each one of us today and what we are experiencing and what we're facing, what we have faced. And even though sometimes we feel like that pet parakeet, <laughs> um, I pray that we might see that you're big enough to handle any problem that we're facing. Amen. Now you notice on your summer notes that first of all, I want us to say that we need to recognize the greatness of our God. David in uh, Psalm 70, 27 says this, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? 
The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom should I be afraid? Some decades ago, J.B. Phillips wrote a little book entitled, Your God is Too Small. <laughs> and many times we have a, a small view of who God is. Let me just share a couple of passages of scripture just to remind us of the greatness of our God. First of all, looking at verses from Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40, beginning at verse 13. Isaiah 40, 13. Who has understood the mind of the Lord or instructed him as his counselor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him? And who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? Surely the nations are like a drop in the bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. And then dropping down later in the chapter, verse 25. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who, who created all these? He who brings out the star hosts one by one and calls them each by name because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired and weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary, and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Then also draw your attention to Psalm 139. The beginning verses one through four talk about God's omniscience. He's the all-knowing God. Oh Lord, you have searched me, you know me. You know when I sit, when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O oh Lord. Even before I speak, God knows what I'm going to speak. And then over to the New Testament in Matthew chapter 10, the words of Christ. Matthew 10, beginning at verse 28. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body and cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your Father. And even the very hairs of your head are numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Well, I talked about uh, J.B. Feld's book, Your God is Too Small. Well, recently, pastor, author, Tony Evans, related uh, the fear his wife has of flying in a small plane. And he would tell her, your faith is too small. And she re would reply, no, your plane is too small. <laughs> you see, we need a 
a Delta jumbo jet kind of God instead of a single engine Cessna. Recognize the greatness of our God. Secondly, I want us to note this morning, acknowledge the reality of your problem. David had plenty of problems. As you read through the Psalm 27, you'll, you pick up on that. Other things we know about David, as a young shepherd boy, fighting, fighting off ferocious animals to protect the flock, Mary, Mary and I got in in the last few minutes of the Sunday school period where Eric was leading, leading and there's a reference to David and Goliath. Here's this young guy facing this giant. Talk about fear and having to de depend upon God. We know that the first king, Saul, was going to be replaced and Samuel anointed David as the replacement. It took some time before he actually took the throne and King Saul didn't like that. In fact, he pursued David to try to kill him. And we know that David, his own son, Absalom, Absalom turned against him. So he had some very real problems. With what, what might you be dealing? Health issues would be a concern that we have. Many of you here this morning are parents or grandparents. Mary and I are privileged to have three children. Our oldest son and his family live down in Peoria, Illinois. Our youngest son and his family live down in, uh, did I say, I said, our old son lives down in St. Louis, Missouri. Our youngest son lives in Peoria, Illinois. And our daughter is the closest to us geographically, living in, in uh, western Wisconsin in New Richmond, about 70 miles from our place. Well, the 11-year-old daughter of our daughter's best friend has had her third bout with cancer. Her first surgery was at 22 months old. And as of Friday, in a hospital in Minneapolis, the parents had signed a DNR, a do not resuscitate. I mean, humanly, it looks hopeless. Her body is shutting down. And so Friday night, family and friends, including our daughter, her husband, and two sons, were saying goodbye. Now, anything short of miracle can bring her back in this life. Our oldest son in St. Louis, his wife's youngest brother, several years ago at age 38, had devastating diagnosis of cancer, terminal cancer, and God miraculously, miraculously, miraculously touched him, and, and he's had unbelievable health up until just about last week when they noticed that the cancer has returned. Those kinds of things trouble us, and we ask why. Now, perhaps you've gone through some particular high health concern yourself. August 20th, 1991, be 28 years ago next month, I collapsed with a brain aneurysm. We were living in uh, Illinois at the time, and a neurosurgeon in uh, Peoria, Illinois, would not give my wife or our three teenage kids any assurance of life, death, or the quality of life. God raised me up and <laughs> gave me extension of time. Uh, unbelievable. 
So we have health concerns for family, friends, maybe ourselves. How about jobs? Is that a concern for you? Now those that are younger, they're wondering, well, what does God want me to do with my life? Beyond high school, should I go to get some technical training or go to a liberal arts college? What does God want me to do? And then once you have a job, there might be a downsizing so that <laughs> you're without work. <laughs> or recently, uh, as we experienced in Eau Claire and Marshfield, shop go actually closed down. Those are hard things to deal with. What about schooling? I suppose a lot of the young people are really glad they're on sum, uh, summer break. <laughs> And they sort of dread going back th this fall. Why? There may be bullying going on. Maybe they're, they're the object of bullying. And now even they can bully on social media. It's devastating. How about churches? Do churches go through challenges or problems? Currently, your church is going through a transition of leadership, seeking a new pastor. And I'll ad address that challenge at the conclusion of my message. How about relationships? There can be misunderstandings. Annoyances. It might be in friendships, it might be in dating situations, or it might even be in marriage and dealing with the harsh realities of separation and for some divorce. Marriage is hard work. <laughs> Mary and I, even though we were both from Wisconsin, we didn't meet until we were both students at Buffalo College in St. Paul, Minnesota, back in the 60s. March 15th, 1969, we committed ourselves in marriage. So just a few months ago, we had a milestone anniversary, 50 years. Joys, challenges, marriage is hard work. How about finances? Maybe you're overwhelmed by debt. What can I do for an extra income? It may be spiritual struggles. Maybe you've uh, been attending this church and you hear people talk about personal relationship with Christ and the joys of following him and the struggles. But, but you're sort of an outsider. You're still struggling with making a personal commitment to Jesus Christ. Or you may know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, but yet you're struggling with certain temptations or decisions, uh, doubts. And there might be other issues too that you're, you're dealing with. Well, we need to recognize the greatness of our God. We need to acknowledge the reality of our problems. But thirdly, I want us to see that we need to review and claim what you know to be true. I'm going to use David as an example. For example, in um, Psalm 56, verse 3, he says there, when I am afraid, I will trust in you. Notice he says, when, not if. If I'm afraid, when I'm afraid, I will trust in you. In Psalm 27, let's look at one of those verses. It takes a conscious decision in verse 8. 
He writes, my soul says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. It's sort of like reminding yourself, <laughs> saying, self, you need to look to the Lord. And that's what Paul, David did. Let's also look at the, the uh, Apostle Paul in uh, Romans chapter 8. I want to just highlight a few verses. In Romans chapter 8, verse 18, he says this, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. In other words, take things in perspective. What we're experiencing now is temporary. We're looking forward to that which is eternal. And then uh, jumping ahead in the chapter to verse 28, which is a favorite of many. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now this is a verse that believers in Christ, true Christians can claim, those who love him. The Apostle Paul, as he summarized his ministry there in the first century among Jews and non-Jews alike, boiled it down to two emphases that he had, repentance and faith. Repentance toward God the Father and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Recognizing that by nature we have offended a holy God because of our sin. And recognizing the only way to solve the sin problem is to put our complete faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Repentance and faith. So maybe you're even here this morning, you're not, not taking those two steps of repentance and faith. I'd encourage you to do that as God speaks to your heart. And then we find the example not only of David and Paul, but Joseph. Remember how his brothers <laughs> sold him into slavery, put him in a pit, and God raised Joseph up to be second in command in Egypt. And in, uh, at the close of uh, Genesis, we read in verse 30, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So God using tough situations for his glory. Let me just share couple of passages of scripture on a personal note. Back in 1978, we were ministering at a church in Nebraska, and I received a call to a church on the east side of Cleveland, Ohio. Just been out there a few weeks, and uh, my mother they figured she had a stroke, but as it turned out, she actually had a brain tumor. So I flew back to Wisconsin and met and stayed with my father in the waiting room at the Marshall Hospital and was there when the doctor, the surgeon gave the report. It was a malignant brain tumor. Now both my mother and father were devout Christians, actively involved in the church for him. And my father referred to 1 Thessalonians 5.18, which reads, 
giving thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. He admitted sometimes it's really hard to claim a verse like that. When I was a junior in high school, my parents gave me a Christmas gift of a study Bible, and my mother handwrote Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. And then in parenthesis she wrote today, tomorrow, and forever. I really treasure that Bible. <laughs> it had rebound as a reminder of someone who really loved the Lord and wanted her children to serve the Lord too. Now the question, why? Back in 1978, there wasn't the kind of, of protocols or treatments for brain cancer as there are even today. And my mom didn't handle chemo very well at all. So she only lived from four, for 14 months after diagnosis. So she went home to glory <laughs> at age 66 in 1979. My father had the privilege of living until 2002, just a few months shy of 93 years old. Now we can ask, why? <laughs> why does God take some and leave others here on earth? Well, we don't understand necessarily why God does things the way he does. This is where trust really comes in. And I said I'd address the issue of your church being in transition. You see, I went to Bethel College and Seminary, and then my first pastor was in northern Wisconsin in 1970. So I've been a pastor since 1970. And I had a friend uh, who was an intern pastor <laughs> and said, Ken, any time you're thinking of seriously retiring from full-time ministry, how about considering being an intern pastor? <laughs> At that point, he was on staff with Intern Pastors Ministries. And as it turned out, in 2011, I, I did re resign or retire from full-time ministry in West Minnesota, and we moved to Eau Claire. So I, I've been on staff with Interim Pastors Ministries since 2012. Now, Interim Pastors Ministries came about because uh, district superintendents within the even Jekyll Free Church of America decided back in 1990, one of the great areas that they could help the churches was to help them during that time of transition of leadership. And so, Interim Pastors Ministries was formed. And today there's over 145 pastors on staff and up to 100 on assignment at any given time. Mary and I have had the privilege of being involved in four interim pastors. And God has really stretched our own faith as we've worked with congregations through that process. But I want, I want to share with you um, ways in which I challenge those four churches that I served. Now, currently, your church is well on the way uh, 
interviewing candidates for uh, potential candidates uh, for the, a new pastor. But as an interim pastor with experience in that, in that way, I want to just challenge you as I challenge those four congregations. First of all, there are verses to memorize and review. And we printed for you those verses. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. I'd encourage you to memorize those verses and to claim them for your own congregation. And then also, I want to challenge you in terms of a prayer ministry. Now, your search committee or team, whatever they're called, is currently at work. I've already interviewed some candidates. They need the wisdom of the Lord as to who to pursue and who not, and so and this is decisions that have to be made. I encourage you to pray daily by name for each member of that search team. They need your support. Don't end there. <laughs> when you have a new pastor on board, pray for him too and his family. Pray for the leadership of your church. Well, God is big enough to handle anything that we're facing. We need to recognize the greatness of our God. We need to recognize the reality of our problems. We need to review and claim what we know to be true. Emphasis upon the memorizing verses. I've been fascinated looking at your uh, Facebook page and see that you have a thriving Awana ministry and a number of the churches that we've been in have also had Awana with a great emphasis upon hiding God's word in our hearts. So we need to review and what we claim to know as, as true because it's in God's word. Would you pray with me, please? God, we thank you for these moments together. And I thank you for this congregation, for them as individual people and the issues that they're facing. If they have to trust you, Lord, if there's anyone here this morning that has yet not placed their total trust in Jesus Christ for their eternal salvation, I pray that even today might be their day of decision. And then on this holiday weekend, we thank you for the country in which we live and for the admonition of scripture that we pray for those in authority over us. And I pray for our president and those in leadership. I pray that more for more unity and harmony among those who govern us. Lord, we also pray for those who are seeking to live out the Christian faith under governments where there's fear of interruption or persecution or even death for being aligned with Jesus Christ. God, I thank you for who you are 
and for what you're doing in our lives individually and what you're going to do through the ministry of Calvary Bible Church. In Jesus' name, amen.